Welcome to the B'nai B'rith International Podcast. I'm CEO Dan Mariash. Thanks for spending some time with us. One brief reminder, check out our video interview series, Conversations with B'nai B'rith on Facebook and YouTube. You'll find discussions with historians, diplomats, Middle East experts, even an astronaut and an NFL player, and a legendary DJ. Watch our latest content by subscribing to the B'nai B'rith YouTube channel and liking us on Facebook at B'nai B'rith International. Not long after the Nazis invaded Poland in September 1939, German forces began forcing millions of Jews in Eastern Europe into ghettos where inhabitants were subject to the most inhumane conditions. In the Polish capital of Warsaw, home to the world's second largest Jewish population before the war, Nazis established the largest of more than 1,000 ghettos set up across Europe. Lacking the most basic supplies and facing unimaginable oppression, Jews in many ghettos carried out fierce uprisings, including the famous Warsaw Ghetto Uprising beginning in April of 1943. Yet of all the history books written about World War II and incredible Jewish resistance during the Holocaust, one key component is frequently missing for one reason or another, women. Many of the couriers, smugglers of arms and documents, editors of newspapers and fighters were women. Many were active in Jewish youth movements, primarily Zionist youth movements, before and even during the war. And their skills at organizing, personal discipline and leadership came directly from those experiences. For decades, their courage has been omitted from or remained in the background of resistance histories. But with her new book, The Light of Days, The Untold Story of Women Resistance Fighters in Hitler's Ghettos, Dr. Judy Battalion has written one of the most important narrative histories of World War II that has already been optioned for a motion picture by director Steven Spielberg. And Dr. Battalion is with me today to talk about these Jewish women who didn't think twice about risking their lives and joining the resistance. Dr. Battalion, who spent 12 years researching and writing the book, was born and raised in Montreal, Canada, and has written for the New York Times, Vogue, the Washington Post, and many other publications. Prior to her writing career, she was an academic, having earned her PhD in art history from the Courtauld Institute at the University of London. And she's fluent in both Yiddish and Hebrew, which I'm sure helped immensely in researching this book. Judy, thanks for being with me today. We're so pleased that you could be with us. Thank you so much for having me. I I'm really excited to be here. Well, first, tell us about your experience growing up by Holocaust survivor families with loss and suffering. And surely that must have shaped your interest in the women in the resistance movements during World War II. And you write about your grandmother in particular, but I'm sure there must have been in a community like Montreal, which had a large number of survivors, that this must have had some influence on the way you see this issue. Um, sure. Uh, I, I come from a family of Holocaust survivors on my mother's side. My um, my, all four of my grandparents were born and raised and married even in Poland, but my father's parents came over before the war to Canada. My mother's parents were in Warsaw. They escaped from Warsaw. They fled east and um, made it across the Russian border and were sent to Siberian war camps. And that is where they survived a um, good number, the majority of Polish Jews who survived, in fact, survived by fleeing east um, in Russia, though they never talked about the experience. It's another underreported story um, for the next book. Um, and I, they eventually came back and went and they actually lived in, in Israel for a while. They lived in and then moved to Montreal, where I was born and raised in a Holocaust survivor family and community, as you say, there was a large number of Holocaust survivor families. Most of my friends were from Holocaust survivor families. And I went to a Jewish day school um, that uh, I only realized while researching for this book actually came directly from um, Polish Jewish education philosophies. It was a, 
secular socialist school. It was actually a merger of Zionists, the parrot school, and the Bundist, the folk school. Um, but they were socialist and secular. And they, we, I studied Hebrew and Yiddish language and literature. And that was how I came to understand Judaism and my Jewish history th through language and literature. So I think in many ways coming from a Holocaust survivor community in particular, directly, I was directly educated in the same way of many of the figures that I, that I write about really helped me feel a connection to them and to their stories. You know, you talk about fleeing East. Uh, I was in graduate school at Brandeis and the Judaica library uh, at that time um, was from Poland and spent uh, the war years actually in Samarkand. So there was that entire community that had really gone east in this particular case to uh, to the to Uzbekistan and then in the Soviet Union. So there 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 was that, um, and many of those who did flee uh, did did come from Poland. So you you spent some time earlier in your career uh, working in London as an art historian. Um, when did you begin searching for uh, a different perspective on, on women in the war? You, you came across, in your research, you came across a book, uh, Frauen in the Ghettos, um, which uh, seems to have been at that particular point lost in time, uh, and you revived it. Uh, tell us about that and, and the path that you took toward uh, dealing with uh, this particular subject and writing about this subject. Sure. So I should start out by saying that this book came to be by accident. I, I wasn't a Holocaust scholar. I was an art historian. Um, I was not looking to write a book about World War II. Um, uh, but I was in my, I was living in London at the time. And this was uh, 14 years ago in 2007. And it was a time in my life where I was thinking a lot about my Jewish identity. Um, I was thinking about, in particular, what I what I call the emotional legacy of the Holocaust, the way that trauma passes through generations. I'm a very anxious person, and I started thinking about how you know how much of my anxiety is shaped by my heritage. Um, I, I was having a lot of issues in perceiving, reacting to danger, and and I wondered how much of that came from my my family background, and I decided to write a performance piece about this. I was also doing some performing at the time. Um, and I wanted to write about a strong Jewish woman who had confronted danger. That was going to be the backbone of this performance piece. And the first woman to come to mind was someone that I'd studied in fifth grade. Her name was Hannah Senish, um, who you might know of, but just for those listeners who, who don't know who she is, she, Hannah Senish was a Hungarian Jew. She was young, about 20. She made Aliyah and moved to what was then Palestine in the 1930s, uh, became a, a poet and a songwriter. You might know her, her, her work. Um, but she decided during World War II to fight back. She joined the Allied forces. She became a paratrooper. She volunteered to return to Nazi-occupied Europe. And, you know, I'd always, she, she was actually killed um, she was caught and killed very, very early on, but I, I'd always learned that she, you know, she looked her executioners in the eye when they shot her. She was a symbol of Jewish pride and courage and a hero figure. Um, but I decided it, I, I wasn't interested in Hannah Senesh, the hero. I wanted to understand Hannah Senesh, the person who, who does that, who chooses to go fight the Nazi, who volunteers? What, what motivates that kind of audacity, that boldness? And really, because I was interested in the psychology and the psychological element of, of, of confronting danger. So what I wanted was a nuanced biography of Hannah Senesh, someone who had studied her, not, not simply through a hero narrative, but really explored her personality. So I went to the British Library, um, where I spent much time as, a, as an art historian, and I looked up Hannah Senesh in the catalog, and there were not very many books about her, but I just ordered what they had. And one of these books that I went to pick up was quite unusual. Um, it was, as you say, an old book from the 40s with the dusty pages and a blue fabric cover and gold writing, and it was in Yiddish. It was called Freuen in the Ghettos, Women in the Ghettos. Um, but as you also said, I even more unusual 
people in the book, I speak Yiddish from my, from my bizarre Montreal upbringing. And so I just started flipping through this book, trying to see what they, what they were saying about Hana Senish. Um, but I couldn't find Hana Senish in this book. And it turned out she was only in the last few pages. In front of her were, you know, 150, 160 pages of small type Yiddish of listings and stories and bios and obituaries and excerpts of dozens and dozens of other young Jewish women who fought the Nazis and who primarily fought them from the Polish ghettos. And, you know, these had chapter titles like ammunition, partisan combat, weapons. Um, It was was so different in both tone and content to really any Holocaust narrative I'd ever ever heard, I'd ever come across. And, and I, I knew I'd found some, I, I knew I'd found a treasure, this kind of old Yiddish treasure. And it, it was beshert, I say, <laughs> that, it, that this happened. Again, I wasn't looking to write this, um, but that's really where this whole project started. Well, in the end papers of your book, there are many, many women, many names uh, that, that you have um, placed there uh, in, in their memory, but you weren't able to cover all of them. Um, many of these stories uh, really are terrific because what you've been able to do is to zero in on the individuals. You're telling these individual stories um, and we're, we're gonna get to those, a few of them in a minute. Uh, you, you're focusing on, uh, on this, this one group largely in Poland, um, for me, Vilna, of course, it went back and forth. So I think of it as Lithuania, but um, uh, Poland at, at that time, all part of the armed underground Jewish resistance that operated in 90 Eastern European uh, ghettos. Now, we can, let's begin to, to talk about them. We can ma- name a couple. For example, uh, Renya Kukielka or uh, Witka Kempner, um, especially Renya, because you follow a few of them you follow really all the way through. And they, the stories go all the way through to, to Israel. Unfortunately, I understand just not many days ago, we just lost one of them, uh, the, the photographer uh, whom you write about. So tell us about those stories and how you were able to track the individual stories all the way through, right through the war, almost day by day. Okay. Um, do you want me to tell you a bit about them or do you want me to talk more about the research side of things? Let's talk about the, the research and then what it is that, that they did that justifiably merited this uh, uh, very um, introspective uh, attention that you have given them. Okay, so I'll start with the research. So as I said, this all began from this Yiddish book, which listed dozens and dozens of Jewish women who who participated in this organized resistance. I didn't really understand it at all when I first came to it. There was very little context in this book, certainly not for a contemporary reader. So I I wasn't even sure what what, what they were really referring to. And so I... I went, but there were great tidbits of stories and anecdotes and very dramatic anecdotes, which I'll come back to when I tell a bit about their stories. But what I did is I made a list of these women and then I I went to find out more about them. So I went to whatever archives and libraries I could think of that held survivor stories, testimonies, Um, even just Hebrew and Yiddish language and literature. And I searched and found whatever documents I could find. Many, it turned out many of these excerpts, many of these pieces in that Yiddish book were excerpts from longer works, some published, some unpublished in all kinds of languages. And so I tracked these down. um, And then I went on and found often um, these women had left several testimonies, some in the 40s, some in the 1990s, around 2000, later in lives. Those were kind of the two biggest periods where they left testimonies. So I I found as much of their writing there, even some of them left oral testimonies, video testimonies. So I I found as much of that as I could to put together their their tellings, their life stories. Um, And then afterwards, I met with their families. I tracked down families um, and met with as many as would talk to me 
And I was very interested, as I said, when I started this, I was interested in, you know, the generations, what happens after the war. I wanted to also know for those women who survived, what, what happened to them? How did they continue surviving? What were their lives like? Um, what were their lives like after, after such dramatic and traumatic experiences early in life? These were women who were in their late teens and, and early 20s, basically. They had their whole lives ahead of them. So what did they do with these lives? How did they reshape themselves? So I talked to their families, not about their war stories, that I took from their writings largely, but about who they were as mothers, as grandmothers, what they, what they liked to do, what they liked to eat, what they liked to cook. Um, and, and all these conversations helped me fill in elements of their, their life stories, um, even, even from before and during the war, as I sort of got to know them through the lens of their families as well. So all of this came together so that I could write what, what I call very close third person kind of accounts of these women. I tried to tell the story largely from their perspectives with, of course, context and explanation for, for a contemporary reader. Now, how did you choose? I mean, I have in front of me here, I, I've got Renya Kukielka and, and Sivia Lubetkin and Tosia Altman, um, uh, Vladka uh, Kempner and, and Bella Hazan. How did you narrow it down to those stories of these individuals? Yeah, this was, I mean, this was a very difficult decision. Who to include, who to, who to omit. I, you know, I felt such a duty to tell every story I found. If I didn't tell the story of Fromka Plodnitska, who was a leader in the war, so I got to, who would tell her story? Um, I, for those who didn't survive, I often felt like a, a, the granddaughter they, they never had. I, I felt very responsible to them. So for me, cutting out any story was very difficult. Um, fortunately, I had an editor to help me with that. Um, but it, in the end, there were a few factors that helped me decide whose stories to include. Some of that had to do with who left the most robust testimony um, sometimes they were written during the war. I mean, Gusta Davidson was killed, but she wrote a, a diary in prison, in a Gestapo prison in Krakow that was so detailed and insightful and, and, and just smart and literary. I mean, that was a, a great source that I could, I could use. Um, others wrote much more developed testimonies after the war. So to some degree, the, the more information I had, the, the closer... I was the, the easier my job was to to tell the story, but it was also very important for me to show scope. I wanted to really write a, a more panoramic history. I didn't want this to be the story of two Jewish women or three Jewish women. This was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Jewish women were involved in this organized underground. And I wanted to show the range of their activity. So here we'll get a little bit into what they did. I want to, you know, this range from running soup kitchens, helping orphans, running underground schools, secret schools. There was a secret medical school in the Warsaw Ghetto to printing underground bulletins, smuggling underground bulletins, which they would hide in braids in their hair. Um, and this was all the way through women who blew up Nazi supply trains and shot Gestapo men in the head and were ghetto fighters flinging Molotov cocktails and bombing tanks in ghetto uprisings. Um, one of the main roles of Jewish women in this organized underground was the role of courier girl, as you said before. Um, in Hebrew, it's keshariot connectors, which is a good word. Um, and these women were young Jewish women who pretended to be Christian, to be Catholic, young Catholic women, and they slipped out of the ghettos and they connected the ghettos. They would travel between the ghettos, at first bringing Jews information. Jews in ghettos weren't allowed to have radios or newspapers. It was often young Jewish women who came with even information about what the Nazis were doing with, with their genocidal plan. They brought this information. They then smuggled cash, medical supplies, fake Aryan papers, passports, fake IDs. Um, and when these undergrounds in the ghettos became 
militias. It was often these young Jewish women that were bringing the weapons into the ghettos. They were meeting weapons dealers. They were meeting contacts from the Polish resistance. They were buying guns and explosives and ammunition and hiding them in handbags, fancy handbags that they bought for this purpose um, in their clothes, in their undergarments and sneaking them back into the ghettos to arm the undergrounds. And they also did rescue work. They, um, they helped take Jews out of ghettos, out of slave labor camps, children too, and find them relatively, you know, safe spots, hiding spots in forests, in the city, with farmers, um, wherever they could, they would pay off the hiders. They would come as often as they could and visit their, their charges, bring them medical help if needed, move them if the hiding spots were not safe any longer. Um, so this was, I wanted to show them, and this is just some examples of the work they did, but it was important for me to show this wide range. But you're also, you were able to follow right through the war, these, these stories. And you're, you're not really, you, you, you're not just telling little snapshots. You're, you're following the individuals, those who survived, those unfortunately uh, who didn't. I mean, I, I, find, I found breathtaking, for example, uh, reading about several of the women that you write about um, who were carrying uh, Ford's papers and they were on trains and they were on uh, the entrance near the entrance to the ghetto and their papers were, were, were checked and done double checked and triple checked and you know you're waiting for something to go wrong but ultimately it, it went right I mean that, that you you have that that detail down and I found really very fascinating um, the idea that that these women who were posing as as Polish women um, who were able really to uh, to slip in and slip out uh, it, it is really a, a tremendous uh, story um, about other um, undergrounds and other ghettos. Now, there are uprisings in at least nine cities, uh, including Warsaw. Um, if you can tell us about some of the, the specific acts of heroism, I have to tell you that you, you really feel, when you write about the Warsaw ghetto uprising, I, I really felt, as much as one can, uh, that I was right there. Uh, you, you, you have that, that detail and, and the, the facts down in such a way that you really feel you're in the midst of the ghetto as you're reading this. So tell us about some of, know about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, of course, but perhaps some of the others that, that people might not know about. Sure, I mean, I should also say, even though I too grew up knowing about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, but I didn't really know the details of it until I came to write this book. So, and you can see I'm a very obsessive researcher. So that's why I too really, you know, I read so many memoirs, so many accounts and really, followed up on the details. How did they get the gas for the Molotov cocktails? I wanted to understand that. Um, so those things were very important to me as a historian and, and a writer. Um, I went down a lot of rabbit holes like that. Um, in terms of other ghettos, I mean, one thing I should say is every, all these uprisings that I write about in this book were youth uprisings. In the Warsaw Ghetto too, I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that it was largely um, teenagers who were fighting, people in their early 20s. Um, the other ghettos as well, because I write about this same movement that occurred across the country. Um, and it was also young people. The, none of them had as large uprisings as Warsaw or perhaps as successful, depending on, on what that even means. Um, but there were, you know, even in a town like Częstochowa, which I only talk about very briefly in the book, they had collected weapons, all kinds of ways of finding materials to create explosives in their underground laboratories. And, and, and they, when the liquidation day came, they fought off the Nazis and it, with whatever m weaponry and materials that they had. And in, in that case, many of them tried to escape, wound up in the forest, they were chased into the forest. So every uprising in town is a little different, but this, you know, in Vilna, there was an attempted uprising. It didn't, it went a bit awry. They, they fought a little bit, then, they, then the Nazis left and they escaped as well through sewers, which is what happened in Warsaw too. Um, in Beijing, a town that I, I, I focus on quite a bit because a lot of these women were, were from, were, worked in the underground there. Um, you know, the uprising was, was, you know, it was by all accounts, uh, 
you know, perhaps, you know, it was a, I don't want to say a failed attempt, but, you know, they couldn't get the guns in the right places and they, it caught them by surprise. And, you know, but Frumka went down shooting from a bunker. So um, in, in every case, it was, you know, a slightly different story, but it was the same movement of young Jews who attempted to, to, to really fight for freedom. Let's talk about that. Um, you you know, you talk about success and failure. I, I don't even think it's an issue of, a, of success or failure. It's the fact that they did this. It's the fact that they, that they uh, were not, not a matter of even uh, summoning the courage, but the, what impelled them was this, um, this love of their people. Uh, many of them were Zionists. Uh, they held out perhaps, you know, the, the hope and the wish that one day they, they would um, arrive in, in Eretz Israel. But let's, let's take that now back to the youth movements. And as I alluded to in, in my introduction, many of the women, if not all of them, come out of these organized youth movements that prepared them for leadership roles and, um, and, and that, that kind of, of thing in terms of entering the next stage of, of society is such as it was going to be, it wasn't, unfortunately. So tell us a little about those movements and how that was organized for these young people. Yeah, this is such an important part of the story. And again, something I'd know nothing about prior to this research. So in the 1930s uh, in Poland, which is now my new favorite era for another book yet and another Zoom, um, Jewish youth was largely organized into youth movements. There were 100,000 young Jews were members of these youth groups. Um, and these youth movements it, were affiliated with often political parties or political slants. So there were more religious and more secular. There were socialists, there were Zionists, there were communists, um, there were the Bundists who were the diasporatists, Yiddishists. Um, there were there were many opinions and many philosophies, and and they all had their youth movements. Um, these youth movements were like the scouts. You know, they even wore. If you look at the photos, often they have little ties. The men and women were, but they, I always say they were more so than the scouts. These were spiritual, intellectual, social, emotional, and physical uh, training grounds for young Jews, and. In my book, I focus particularly on the socialist youth movements, mostly Zionist and some Bundists as well. And in these groups, you know, you had, you know, they really valued, um, they were certainly valued equality and egalitarianism. Women had leadership roles. Women were very educated in Poland in the 1930s. Um, they also, they, you know, they physicality, um, self-sufficiency as a Jewish pride, pride in our heritage, pride in our people. Um, they studied Jewish history. They also studied psychology and so they read psychoanalysis. They were very emotionally aware. They discussed their relationships. They discussed, they were, they were socialists. They believed in collectivism and collaboration. And they talked about how to work together in many of these groups, in particular, the Zionist socialist groups, many of these young people left home. Um, this is before the war and moved in to kibbutzim or communes that were all over Poland in the 1930s. I, ha I had no idea about that. And they lived together. They developed strong bonds with each other. They, they used to joke that their last name was the name of their youth movement. I mean, their identity was so tied to this movement. They, they, their, these were philosophical and, and emotional and social um, intense units. And they really were primed to become these underground cells. They, they were organized and they knew how to work together and they worked together for a principle. They, they were trained to do that. You know, what I found very interesting is you, you start really just around the time that the war begins <clears throat> and you give a lot of context to the upbringing of these individuals, not just that they were members of these youth groups, but the families that they lived in, the interests that they had. Uh, and you wonder, you know, what they would have been had there been no war and, and no Holocaust. But what I found really interesting is that these units stayed together in many cases. I mean, you write about them in the bunkers, that, that there were these, these redoubts where they would, they would continue to conduct their meetings and their activity and plan their, uh, their, their various attacks or 
the smuggling or whatever it was, that even in the most difficult hours that they face, they still stay together as a group. Don't you think, I mean, that's a, that, that, that rather than just everything kind of unraveling, on the contrary, they became very close. They became each other's families. They were very intensely connected before the war and even more so. So during the war, most of them, their, their parents were killed, they were orphaned, and this, this was their surrogate family. I mean, in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, you know, it involved about 750 young Jews, about uh, just under 200 were women, and the, their, their fighting units, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising was very, very organized. It stra- there was strategy. There were meetings about, you know, military plans. This was an organized uprising. But each of the fighting units was the, their youth group. That youth group became the, their fighting unit, and they each had their own position and their own, you know, way of working and their own job in the uprising. But that unit from from Hashemir Hatzair or from Drur or from the Bund, um, that that was their their fighting unit. The, the, these bonds were very intense. So you follow them, uh, many of them to to Israel, um, and um, you spend time with their families, uh, which you you talked about. We we often hear, and perhaps in your family this this was the case, or you know about this, is that we have many instances where survivors uh, were reluctant to share their experiences, to spare these stories on their children and grandchildren, uh, or mainly on their children. Maybe sometimes it changed with grandchildren. Uh, that, that kind of changed the, the dynamic. Um, what do you come away with from your discussions with their children? Um, how many of, of these women actually shared the stories? How many did it later in life? Um, what was that situation uh, all about? Yeah, this is a great question. And o- overall, almost none of the women shared the stories with their children. And if they did, it wasn't until later in life. And usually because finally the, ch- the child or you, often the grandchild really prodded them, what happened to you in the war? What is the story? Um, and, and that's when they started to speak about it a bit more. Um, Many of these women didn't, as we said, they're very young during the war. When the war was over, they, they were 22. They had 20. They had their whole lives ahead of them. And, and sometimes they did talk about it right at the beginning, but then, but then stopped. And partially, you know, there were, they were not believed. They, there was a lot of, um, I read about this a lot, feelings of, you know, being accused of the, that they, you know, they must have collab for those to survive. They must have done something. They collaborated. They slept their way to safety. They they turned inward. Um, they they didn't often tell. Ta- they they also suffered from very um, pungent survivor's guilt, feeling even that they're, you know, compared to their fellow survivors who'd been through Auschwitz, they hadn't had it so bad they almost didn't merit telling their story. And, and that too caused them to turn inward. But I think a lot of it was they needed to create new lives. They didn't want to burden their children. They wanted to, they wanted to have Jewish children to repopulate the Jewish people and, and to raise families that were happy and normal. Um, and they, they just didn't, they didn't tell these stories for a very long time. So, to what do you attribute this, this tremendous courage that, that these women uh, exhibited? They were, they were tortured, they were beaten, um, they, they saw the worst possible things that, that one can imagine, and, and yet this, this persistence in, in standing up, in fighting, um, really at, at risk every hour to their lives, what do you ascribe this to? Because, you know, they say that, you know, in history, you know, people rise to the occasion and you, you never know who they are. And then one day they're there. Uh, that's, you know, the, the, the great man and great woman theory of, of history that uh, it takes adversity sometimes for people to step up. But there's something there's something more here. What, what do you think it is? I mean, 
the the million dollar question. I think that I write about different people, so I think it's a little different for different people. I think some of it is that in you know these were extreme situations that made people act in extreme ways. Um, I think a lot of this had to do with their youth movement training. As we discussed, they they were leaders. They were they were already leaders, community leaders before the war. They were confident. They had a was saying they're principled, they had belief systems, they, they, they literally were taught how to analyze and, and dissect and plot and act. And they themselves talk about how important their youth movement training was to their activity. The ones who survived, they attribute it to often what they learned in Hashomer Hatzair or Dror. Um, they talk about being influenced by family members. Um, and, and getting strength from fathers or sisters. But, and then, you know, I, I mentioned before that Gusta Davidson left a diary during the war. It was buried, she hid it in the prison and it was found after the war. And she has a very insightful take and, and style of writing. She, she, you know, a great writer, a great mind. And she also wrote a lot about the, the their grief. The, these were, young people who were newly orphaned, their whole world fell apart. They were unhinged. It, nothing made sense anymore. And being part of this organized group gave them purpose and, and family and camaraderie. And they were, they were so furious and, and so grief stricken that this, this, this work gave them a, a place to put that energy. Um, uh, it, it, it helped them direct their emotions to something productive. So what do you hope readers of your book uh, and listeners to this uh, interview uh, will take away from your book and your 12 years of research in, in telling this story? I, you know, I think first of all, and a, a sort of what they call it, myth buster level. I, I really hope that, you know, when I, 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 I too had unconsciously kind of imbibed this myth of Jewish passivity in the war. And I mean, now I cannot look at the story of the Holocaust without seeing it as a story of constant resistance and struggle and defiance and resilience and rebellion. I mean, just most people were killed because they were up against a sadistic, brutal military force, but it was a story of constant struggle and, and resistance. So I, I, I do hope this helps to sort of rebalance that narrative. Um, I, I, and I think, you know, at the end of the day, as we were saying, you know, these women were, they had nothing. They had no family. They were starving. They, they, they knew they weren't going to topple the Nazis. They would make jokes, you know, our whole weapons cache fits in a basket. Like they, they weren't out there to, to, to take down the German army, but that didn't matter. It didn't matter. There's, what mattered was they went out there time and time again, fighting for freedom, fighting to rescue people, fighting for justice, fighting for liberty. And these small acts matter. They matter to them, they matter to the people around them, and they matter to us, I think, generations down the line. Um, and they, they are what are necessary for change, too. So I, I, I guess that would be the, the kind of moral, um, if, if there was one, which there isn't really, but that, you know, we, we must do what we can to fight for our beliefs and our, and our convictions. Well, we understand that there will be a motion picture, and we're certainly looking forward to that. Uh, what is, you talked about the 1930s and Poland. What is the uh, the next book? What's your next book project? Don't ask that question. I, 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 I think my next project is going to be some, well, I know my next project, something a bit lighter. Um, I'm going to take a little breather from the material. Part of the reason this book took so long was that I, I couldn't work on it all the time. Um, I did many other things in the interim because it, it was too difficult to, to be in this all the time. So I, I'm working on something a bit lighter. In, and then after that, maybe I'll come back to the 1930s because I've become very obsessed with that now. So I think that's on the list. 
Well, we hope we hope when you when you do, and that uh, when the book is out, you'll come back and, and talk with us. Uh, Judy, really, this this book is a triumph. Uh, what you have done to immortalize these courageous women is really it's it's profound. It's a tremendous contribution to our understanding, fuller understanding, even 76 years after the end of the Holocaust, uh, our understanding of, uh, of what took place and how and by whom. And um, it really is, uh, it's a tremendous, as I say, a tremendous contribution uh, to, to our understanding that period. So the book is The Light of Days, The Untold Story of Women Resistance Fighters in Hitler's Ghettos by Dr. Judy Battalion, and is available in store or online wherever you purchase books. And Judy, thank you for being with us today and bringing to light the stories of these incredibly brave Polish Jewish women who became resistance fighters in the face of unbelievable danger during the Holocaust and World War II. And we're thrilled that you could join us today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Well, if you're looking for more of our diverse content, visit our website, benebrit.org, or listen to all of our conversations, podcasts, and live interviews. A big thanks today to Dr. Judy Battalion for joining me, and thank you for listening. And if you like what you've heard, make sure you never miss an episode by tapping the subscribe button on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm your host, Dan Mary Ashen. Talk to you again soon. Take care, everyone. Bye.